Welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asfalis Advisors and the Disaster Recovery Journal. Crisis management in today's world is ever-changing, and this podcast is our commitment to help you navigate successful outcomes for any crisis you may face. I'm your host, Vanessa Matthews. I specialize in providing insights and solutions for crisis, continuity, and resilience across industries from real estate and healthcare to terrorism in the airline and transportation worlds. No matter what industry you're in, this podcast will provide you the tools to build resilience in your organization. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Resilience Decoded Podcast. Today, I'm super excited because I have two great friends joining me. And in this episode, we are continuing the conversation from the diversity, equity, and inclusion micro simulation at the DRJ Spring 2023 conference. And we're going to be addressing some of the lingering questions posed by the audience. Today, I'm joined by Lisa Jones. She's the Business Continuity General Manager at Control Risks and James Green, the co-founder of Illuminate Advisory. Together, Lisa and James are the co-founders of the Resilience Think Tank Advisory. Lisa and James, welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded Podcast. Hello, my friend. Look, hey, what's going on? Hey, this is James' second time on the podcast, Lisa's first time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I need to catch up with, with James. Look, we're excited. And, you know, for those of you who don't know us, we, we cut up <laughs> when the three of us are together. So I'm really excited, but we had a great time in Orlando at, at DRJ and had a really real and authentic conversation about the state of diversity and inclusion and um, what's needed to continue to move our industry forward. And we had some responses from folks that were very excited and supportive of the conversation, although it was raw and real. And we said some things that most folks probably were not expecting. On the mm -hmm. other hand of that, we had people that were not excited about it and that were upset and that were offended and just cannot really grasp or comprehend why there is a push or need to support diversity and inclusion. And so what we wanted to do today, uh, number one is give a huge shout out to Marcus Vaughn for leveraging his sponsorship with Illuminar um, all the way from Australia to get on a main corporate stage and to talk about the importance of DEI utilizing his product and yet not talking about his product the entire hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> um, but secondly, the questions that we're going to talk about today were the remaining questions left over from the audience that we didn't have a chance to get to. So, James, I'm going to start with you because I just love your energy. Um, any, thoughts, <laughs> any thoughts on how to approach leadership when people say that they are just, quote unquote, checking the box when it comes to ensuring diverse interview panels and committees are needed? Yeah. So I think as some context, you know, one of the one of the comments we got after we came off stage by uh, some of our less than fans were, you know, who are these people that they're DAI experts we're not experts in this at all. We are people who are passionate about diversity in our profession, and we are people who are passionate about our profession. That's where our expertise comes in. I don't claim to be the DEI expert. I'm just a, a person who's very passionate about this topic. So with your question, are, you know, when people are checking the box, we feel management is checking the box. You want to address those issues with management, but you also like, let's be honest, they're management, they're in charge. So the way you address them, you probably want to be a little thoughtful about it. You want to share with them why this is important. And you, you know, most management honestly cares about what drives money. So when you have a lack of diversity in your employee base, it becomes a talent acquisition problem. It becomes a retention problem. Before you even get to the meaningful answers of why we should do this and how it strengthens the organization and it makes us better, you want to, I think, first have those conversations of you weaken your pool of candidates, you have TA problems, talent acquisition problems, and you know studies have shown your retention rates will go down if management doesn't look like the company itself and if the company itself doesn't look like the community in which it operates. Lisa, what are your thoughts on how to approach leadership when they're just checking the box, especially when it comes to diverse panels and committees for interviewing? 
Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just want to start off by saying I appreciate the fact that uh, Marcus took the lead to give this conversation a general session platform. Many times this is taken as a, a breakout session, and I felt that for such a topic, it needed it needed the uh, attention of the whole conference. Secondly, I also want to thank Bob for being uh, <laughs> taking the lead on DNI. There there are no other. I have yet to see other organizations really be at the forefront of this. So uh, Bob Arnold, uh, hats off to you. I know this is this is something that he struggles with. I'm, I know this is something that we all struggle with. Just the conversation itself. But the fact that we can have this conversation uh, is just great for our industry. Um, as far as leadership and how we how we approach them when we talk about checking the box, I agree with everything that James said. Also, we have to look at it from a way of the conversation about the DEI tends to be more emotional. So what is your emotion? When you talk about emotional intelligence, you kind of have to, you know, look at your own emotions when you're talking about this conversation and how you're the person that's receiving the information. What is their emotional intelligence when it comes to the conversation? You do have to, you do have to uh, target the money in the end. You know, I think leadership definitely understands that when you say, you know, retention of, of, of employees loss of revenue, how, what is your, uh, what is the, the brand reputation when it comes to uh, de and I, to your, to your customers, to your consumers, to, to the people that we interact with. So if we can tie those conversations around those topics, and then you can kind of, uh, then you can approach it uh, from that personal view. People may, may not want to hear that, but anything that can get attention is always helpful. As we prepped for the the panel in March of 2023 in Orlando, and then even as we had the, the conversation on stage, we talked a lot about disabilities. And there are some disabilities that are seen, and then there are some disabilities that are unseen. And it was a really interesting conversation because I personally don't think in my 15 year career, there's been enough conversations to even elevate the challenges that people might be experiencing, uh, whether it's from a mental health perspective or something else. So Lisa, I'll take this first one to you. If someone has a disability that they have chosen to never disclose, what responsibility should an employer have towards them? So in other words, how should an employer address what is referred as an invisible disability? This one is is very tough because there are laws and regulations in place that you know people do not have to disclose certain information about themselves. All I can say is that in general, when you're working with in teams and you notice things about people, if people share information with you, uh, the best thing that you can do is just be an ally. You know, only disclose. Of course, you can only disclose what people would like to understand about themselves. But if the organization itself fosters a community a culture of addressing disabilities, whether seen or unseen, that, is, that only helps your organization, only helps the employees feel comfortable. To be honest, you know, particularly after, after COVID and all through COVID, we do, we've seen an increase of people having mental health issues, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety. So I think organizations themselves need to, they need to be more uh, aware of this. I think some companies are, some people have brushed it under the rug, but as we evolve as people, um, I think we'll be more, we'll be at a better place to address those issues. James, what about you? Yeah, you know, that's so hard. So in the United States, we talk about the Americans with Disability Act and that employers have a requirement to give reasonable accommodation, but that's if they know they need to give reasonable accommodation. And there are certainly issues people don't want to disclose. And like Lisa said, I think the key is, do you have a culture, do you have an environment where someone is comfortable sharing not everything, but maybe a certain thing, like just being able to say to their boss, hey, I, I, I can't go on camera today. Like I'll be on this meeting. I just, I can't be on camera today. And are you comfortable saying that 
And is the person leading that meeting going to back you up and say, oh, yeah, James isn't on camera today, but he's here. Uh, I think where, where companies get in trouble is they create that culture of fear where people won't even say, hey, I need not an accommodation from a legal standpoint, but just temporarily, I may be struggling with something right now. I don't want to disclose it, but you trust me. I trust you. Do you treat me as a person at the end of the day? Or, you know, we've seen a, a major employer just this week announced they're going to start checking companies' badge swipes. And if you don't swipe in and swipe out a certain number of times a week, uh, we're going to ding you on your performance review. That's not, to me, really showing people that you care about them. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, well, you know, I, I believe we had a podcast episode with Marie from Gartner, and she talked about the purpose of our presence. So if you're going to ask me to be in the office, what is the purpose of my presence? And that's interesting because I have a friend who had to go into work. His entire team is in a whole nother state. And he had to go into the office in Charlotte and sit on a video camera, which he could have done very well from the comfort of his own home to be on a call with 20 other people who were in another state. And it just yep. sounds ridiculous, like seriously. So how about we take some of this commercial real estate that we don't need and turn it into affordable housing? <laughs> and that sounds very familiar. <laughs> And and also considering, considering this is a whole nother topic for another show, but considering that America ha, is in a deficit of over a deficit of over four million uh houses for people to live in. Four million houses were in a deficit. So we have plenty of space to to use these farm park, these office parks to uh create community. Yeah. So which goes back to this is why diversity is important because it takes a diverse individual who understands different socioeconomic statuses to even ask that question. And providing alternative solutions for affordable housing is a risk decision, mm -hmm. right? So let's talk more about this concept of diversity. And specifically, the question that was posed after our panel was how do we encourage more diversity in the profession when the injury is often legacy? I interpret the people who are in the beginning of the pipeline or who make decisions about who gets hired in the business resilience, crisis management, emergency management, ITDR profession typically look like James, but they're older, right? So how do you encourage more diversity when James is at the front door? James, I'm gonna get that one to you. <laughs> yeah, I hate when James is at the front door, it's scary. Uh, you have to be proactive and thoughtful in, in recruiting people. I think people in their latter part of their career in our profession forget they had no experience in this industry prior. When I first joined this industry, I had zero experience in this industry. There were no degrees. I had zero experience. So you have to thoughtfully go after who are people to me who would make good emergency managers, who would make good crisis managers. I need people who can make decisions in the middle of the night. I need people who can make decisions under stress who can speak and stand their ground with an executive group of people, that has nothing to do with where you went to school, what you do for work. I've recruited a lot of people out of the service industry because if you can wait tables and put up with people's crap being in the service industry, then you can slog it out with an accounting manager who doesn't want to do their BCP. So I think we need to be, we need to be thoughtful about who we bring in. We need to be open-minded. And yeah, we need to be purposeful that everyone does not look like me because, you know, one of my concerns as the demographics of, especially the United States changes, if the demographics of our profession doesn't change, we're going to get further and further out of touch with the organizations that we work in, the communities that we serve. And that's how you become obsolete. Um, when I think of the question about it being legacy, it to me, it means we, who's being assigned the business continuity program in your organization. More times than not, it's coming out of IT. More times than not, this tends to be a, a male-dominated profession, which we understand that women can do IT. I'm just saying we, we, we're we smart. Um, and that's And that's something as just as a society itself, we need to push women into these in these type of roles. So when I think about how it was assigned to me uh, as an administrative assistant who didn't know anything about business continuity and now had a whole career 
my job now is to give is to give back to others or you know bring someone else along with me to say hey you know you may think your career path is this how about this new thing over here and the fact that we think this is kind of to me is new well anyway uh but how about this new thing you might be interested in um and just and like james said it's less about the fundamentals can be taught to anyone it's those soft skills that are very important and and we really need to start marketing that more it's the soft skills it, the, the fundamental stuff again can be taught and even when you learn the fundamental things when you go into an organization we massage it for something else so let's really do a better job at marketing our industry uh marketing to people that may not look like us um and i think that will only help build our profession yeah so as we wrap up today's episode, I'm going to do some spitfire questions and you can only give me one response. James, what is the one thing you want to see industry associations do differently? You want me to give a shorter response on this. That's not even fair. One uh, point. To be thoughtfully inclusive. Lisa, what is one thing you want industry associations to stop doing? Mm. <laughs> I would like organiz uh, industry organizations to stop focusing on one gender. James, what is one thing you want hiring managers to do differently in the business continuity resilience profession? To focus less on tactile requirements or qualifications. And Lisa, what would you like for them to stop doing? To stop writing lengthy job descriptions that have nothing to do with the job. Hashtag I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James, what is one thing that you want vendors and sponsors at these industry association conferences to stop doing? I guess I want them to stop, you know, focusing on the short term of uh, pipeline and more on the long-term of the strength and health of the industry. Lisa, what would you like to see vendors and sponsors to start doing? I would love to see vendors and sponsors to start sponsoring their own clients and customers to speak about different uh, topics and to represent their brand. Well, James, where can our subscribers find you? Uh, you can find me uh, all over social media as the James Green, and our website is illuminatedvisory.com. He's all also right. a pirate, just so you know. <laughs> One is many talents. Right. And Lisa, where can our subscribers find you? You can find me uh, on LinkedIn. Also, don't forget to uh, check us out at the Resilience Think Tank. We would love for you to join our community. Awesome. I appreciate you all and the authentic conversation, and we look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and Disaster Recovery Journal. Make sure you check out the show notes for this episode to see all the upcoming events, programs, and ways we can support you. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast, leave us a review and share it with a friend. Thanks again. And I'll talk to you in the next episode.